Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever may, you may be hailing from. Welcome to Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. I'm Eric, the IT guy, Hendricks, and this is episode number 49. So I cannot believe it. We're, we're almost to 50. <coughs> Excuse me. Joining me today are uh, two of my closest friends, uh, Matthew Yee and Mr. Nate Lager, uh, three of the four uh, of our RHEL technical marketing team. Um, of course, missing is uh, Mr. Scott McBrien, who's out doing some family things. Uh, and so we're, we're definitely looking down our noses at him as, as he figured his family was more important than a live stream. But uh, Nate, Matthew, welcome. That guy, I tell you. Right. <laughs> So it is, uh, it is definitely the last episode of RHEL Presents for the year. We figured that uh, what better topic than to talk about the most recent release of RHEL uh, 9.1 and 8.7. We'll get into some of the details about that as we, uh, as we go on about uh, our, our topic today, but uh, figured this was a good way to, to wrap up the year. Um, so Nate, uh, you've, you've, been, uh, you've been on more and more of our live streams recently. Why don't you introduce yourself to folks that haven't met you and, uh, and we'll dive in. Sure, folks. So uh, you might recognize me. You might not. I don't know. I've been on a couple of these. I'm Nate Lager, um, recent addition to the TMM team, although it's not that recent anymore, is it? I feel like I'm, I'm slowly getting out of the new guy excuse um, phase of my uh, <laughs> my term here. Right. Um, so, right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Nate. You might recognize me from my own uh, outlets from the Iron Sism in podcast. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of me. Technical guy like to get to command lines, but uh, I don't know if we're going to get a whole lot of that today. I'm in a browser. My demo's in a browser. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, sh shame, shame on you, sir. Shame on you. Yeah, I guess I could have gone crazy and went all command line, but I didn't get a chance to. <laughs> and of course, Mr. Matthew Yee, welcome back. Thanks. You want to you want to introduce yourself and and uh, and what uh, some of your responsibilities are. I'm a technical marketing manager, and I look after satellite and um, system roles and web console. Oh, also we're for edge. And, and and Brian Smith can rest easy because we we mentioned system roles, and we'll, we actually have a a point about that a little bit later in the episode. That's become a running joke around here that. Every episode is a system roles episode, whether we know it or not. So, um, Brian, hope you're hope you're watching. Hope you're well. Uh, we'll have Brian back with us uh, first of the year. In fact, uh, well, I'll save that to the end. All right. So, why don't we dive in here, Nate? You want to kick us off? Sure. So, uh, first, we had some important dates, right? So, this episode is going to be about RHEL, about the recent releases of RHEL, uh, and that's all the exciting stuff. But there are some important dates that you're going to want to know about. Um, obviously, with RHEL 8 and now with 9, we're sticking to this pretty rigid release cycle. That means that dates are predictable. And one of those, two of those predictable dates that you're going to want to have on your radar if you're an administrator is that RHEL 8's maintenance, that is the, I think the first phase of its life cycle, ends in May 2024, right? <clears throat> so at that point, I think that's when you're going to be want to looking, you're going to want to start looking into getting your stuff off of 8 and into 9. And RHEL 7, which is currently in its extended maintenance phase, um, will be end of life, June 2024. So that's June 2024 for RHEL 7. That's when that's end of life. And uh, the next phase of maintenance for RHEL 8 starts May 2024. So jot those down, put them in your calendars, make reminders, start telling your boss that you need to move to newer versions of RHEL now because you don't want to be in the, that boat where uh, everybody ends up in a valley where you've got this huge fleet that you have to quickly migrate to something newer. Yeah, I was out at uh, AWS reInvent a few weeks ago, and someone admitted to still having RHEL 5 floating around, and I just had to cover my ears and you know sing fa la 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 because <laughs> uh, yeah, that just uh, that was that was a scary thought to consider, especially since RHEL 5 was my first uh, major version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So that that just brought back some some fears and nightmares one of uh, one of my customers as a tam brought in the tam stuff <coughs> because they had a bunch of rel5 boxes still sitting around and they were at they were end of life and they had bought an extension and that extension was now over <laughs> and they're like what do we do so they brought in a tam to help uh help coordinate with that so you know <laughs> nice. it's out there 
it's out there. And and also don't tell Eric, but uh, I've actually had slides in our in our show today, and and that's that's been a hard and fast rule to not have slides. But don't don't tell Eric. Okay, we won't tell Eric. Um, let's see. So yeah, we've got uh, we've got CentOS and RHEL seven coming end of life in June twenty twenty four. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what you might do to uh, to avert a crisis in that situation a little bit later on in the episode. But something else I wanted to bring up was uh, we've we've we spent a lot of time coming out of um, coming out of of, um, of the the lockdown and spending time uh, as as a business unit talking about uh, what what do we want Rel to be when we grow up. And uh, of course, I'm trying to multitask here, and that's not working out well. <coughs> but I wanted to get your all's feedback on um, one of the one of the things that we we tackled this summer was we actually sat down and came up with sort of a new mission statement. You know, what what do we want Rel to be? What what is our goal? Why are we here? Um, other than making really awesome live streams about a really awesome product, what do we really want to do with ourselves? And so we we came up with a mission statement, and this is this is attributed to Gunnar Hellickson, our our uh, vice president of Linux, and he has like two or three other phrases on his title uh, that I'm forgetting, but he's kind of the head honcho for um, for Rel. He says uh, he this is what we kind of word word shop together. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is your source for safe and reliable Linux innovation that makes your workload successful. Um, and I, I liked this. I liked this this word picture here of finding balance between having innovation, having some of the new tools, some of the new toys built into RHEL, but at the same time not really having, uh, not really uh, escaping from this this tried and true platform, this foundation of of your infrastructure. Um, so Matthew, Nate, any any thoughts about uh, about kind of the 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 direction we're heading? Uh, I just read through that mission statement about three times, and I didn't see any mention of giving Eric a reason to live stream. <laughs> we need to we need to lodge a complaint. I don't disagree. I I think live streaming should be in the realm mission statement. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, I think it's it's a great direction for the realm platform to be moving, and uh, really, you know, any enterprise Linux should be a stable platform, right? And that's exactly what what RHEL is and always has been, a stable platform to make sure that you've got the support that you need and the stability that you need to run your important workloads. Yeah, that's awesome. Matthew, any thoughts? No. Your, 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 your grasp of the English language just blows me away with, with the deepness of that thought. Well, I mean, if you don't have anything insightful to add, why ramble, right? Good job, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. But see, that's that's why I do stuff like this, because it gives me an outlet to go and ramble, and people keep showing up, so I'm not sure why. But we're not going to let Matthew off the hook that easily, because uh, the first section uh, and the, the more fun part of this conversation uh, belongs to you uh, and, uh, and Mr. Brian Smith. Uh, talking about system roles, I know with Realm Nine and and in particular with Nine Point One, we uh, we updated some of the system roles. You want to tell us about what uh, what's new, what's what's improved, and I do yeah. believe we have a demo as well. Can you guys see? That? <coughs> Is that showing up? Sure. Yeah, let me let me drag that in here. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so um, in RHEL 9.1, we added um, support for availability groups with SQL Server. So now you can run highly available, run a highly available SQL cluster, um, and you can automatically configure that with a system role. Um, with uh, storage, we've you can now provision, uh, thinly provisioned volumes with the system rule. And there's support for adding and removing disks from uh, storage pools. And you can also create and attach um, cached volumes to the existing volumes in uh, on your host. There's, um, there's a really important firewall system rule enhancement, which I really like and I'll be demoing later. But 
We often think about using the system rule to make holes in your firewall. What we've added is the ability to reset that firewall back to the default state. And uh, for my purposes, I think this is great because if I'm troubleshooting something, if I end up opening up a whole bunch of holes in my firewall, I did want a really easy way to reset that thing back to fully secure default mode. We've also got some enhancements for the um, HA cluster. Um, I don't know how any of that stuff works, so I'm not going to talk about it. And um, the network system role has been improved. It's using the NM state API. For those of you that don't know what NM, NM state is, it's actually related to a lot of the Kubernetes networking project, or it's a tool that was developed for that. And it allows you to dump all of your network settings in a JSON file or YAML file. And if you've never used it, it's really great for getting a snapshot of all of your settings, including your DNS, including your routes, all that kind of stuff, all in one configuration file. Um, I think I want to talk about what we have coming up in the future. Um, so I really like using system rules because, again, it's really easy to automatically configure your host and to do it multiple times in a repeatable, predictable uh, fashion. What we're going to be releasing new uh, features or new system roles are, um, this is kind of neat, but we'll be coming out with a podman or a container system role. And not only will it allow you to um, conf like manipulate configuration files, but It'll also automate the creation of um, systemd unit files, which means you can automatically get the system role to create, configure your container as a service on your host. So you can just use system control start, whatever the name of your uh, container is, and you'll have that service running easily. <clears throat> um, there's going to be... Yeah, this is, I'm reading from my notes here because I can't remember it all. The So at the moment, when you open a hole with the firewall rule, or even just like manually opening up the hole in your firewall, that doesn't necessarily mean that your service can now start communicating through that hole in the firewall. For example, SE Linux will probably, well, not probably, but it might be preventing your service from using that network port. And this isn't in like, it's not an obvious problem, but it can create a lot of troubleshooting. Like if you don't know that this can be a problem, troubleshooting it can be a massive pain in the ass. So we're going to have an enhancement where we're going to make sure that all of our existing service system roles will reconcile with SE Linux and, and the firewall role. So that if you run a specific, configure a specific service for a system role that we already have, it's also going to check that it works with SE Linux in the firewall. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I just want to interject for one moment and say that yeah. is amazing. <laughs> yeah. The number of times I, I had to deal with that specific problem as a sysadmin uh, just on box, right? Not even accounting for the external firewalls, right? The network level firewalls that are always in the way. <laughs> SC Linux, firewall, and is the service running? If we could bundle those three things together to make sure that they all work into in in triplicate, I guess is that the word I'm looking for? Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> so Tandem. you're gonna love this other rule, Nate. You're gonna be so excited, but we're gonna do the same. We're gonna be able to perform the same operations. That is like reconciling between um, existing uh, system roles but with certificates as well. So if you have if you have multiple services that require certificates on your host uh, and you configure those system rules, we're going to give you the ability to check that they're not stepping on each other. So that's awesome. I, I mean, I do like so, the sound of that. I, 
just just to step you 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 glossed over ha a system role to can help configure ha but this co goes to the same point right system roles are very quickly becoming the setup tool right if you remember a decade decade and a half ago especially with ha there was this this funny like little x windows gui tool that would help you configure ha because ha was complicated it still is complicated it's easier now than it was then uh, but system roles are now becoming that thing that have a so much of a smaller footprint and less requirements and they're easier to use and they're more repeatable um is just awesome work the system roles thank you brian smith yeah and Rich Meganson. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a demo now of the firewall system role, uh, especially with the new enhancement. If I can find my tab. Uh, yeah, I bet their I bet their ears are burning about now. Uh, we did have Brian and Rich on just uh, a couple of months ago talking about system roles, talking about where we're going, and uh, uh, but uh, I mean just the ability to start bundling in systems together really uh, really kind of brings about a much easier method of, uh, of managing systems, especially at scale. So I'm sharing a web page that is accessible by everyone in the audience at lab.redhat.com. And in case you don't know what that is, lab.redhat.com are a bunch of live labs that we have that can help well, our goal is to get you initiated and oriented with using some of uh, the features that we have in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So this particular lab that I have is to demonstrate the use of the firewall system roles. So what I have here is a host. We're going to call that the control host, rel. Um, that is where I'm going to be running my Ansible playbooks that implement the system rule. Now I'm going to be applying that system rule against this host here, which is rel VM, and I'll be manipulating the, the firewall on here. So uh, fire, uh, I'm gonna, so whoops. So I'm running this command just to show you what the default state of the firewall looks like. And Can you uh, zoom in a little bit on your tab there? Sorry? Uh, could you zoom in on your tab? I think it's oh, like okay. the, I think it's super shift plus or something like that. There we go. Oh, much better. Perfect. Thank you. And so this is what the default state looks like. So we've got a a firewall hole open for cockpit, uh, the DHCP client, and SSH. So I'm going to go back here into the control node where I'm going to apply the already created playbooks. Um, I'm not going to show you these since I'm not going to have time, but it, you can go through the lab yourselves if you want. Uh, So what I've just run here, at hosts. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to apply a bunch of arbitrary firewall rules. Oh, there we go. OK. And I'll show you what I've done on the target host. What we have here is I've opened up a hole for, for the um, HTTP uh, browser, well, not, HTTP, not web browser, the web server that's sitting on this box. Um, and then there's an arbitrary port, which is 999-9999 TCP that's open. And I'm also forwarding traffic that goes to from 9999 to port 12345. And this is just a whole bunch of arbitrary stuff for the sake of the demo. So could that be used now, for if you're if you're doing like NAT forwarding or something? Is that what the, the intention of that is? Or you're just forwarding one port to another? It's possible, yeah. That's cool. Um, it, 
I don't know. Some people like to put SSHD on a different port. I don't know why. Um, Security by obscurity. Yeah, right. I remember when I used to run uh, MS SQL servers at a previous job, there was a checkbox in the, the little GUI for setup that said, it basically said secure the port. And all it did was change the port from 1433 to 2433. As if that was it, done, you're secure. No one will ever find it. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> nah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, what I wanted to show here by showing this playbook called reset. So reset is where you keep a bunch of variables, but in order to reset your firewall, you put in this variable here. Um, Eric, if you can, I think I put in a link to the firewall documentation. If you want to blast that out. And we'll definitely have that included in the show notes. Uh, usually yeah, a couple of hours after the, after the uh, episode goes live. It takes me some time to go and grab all the links. So this, this stuff is all pretty well documented, in my opinion. Um, <coughs> your mileage may vary. Um, so what am I doing here? I am going to apply the reset the reset uh, variable to my playbook and reset the firewall. So that's going to run here. And uh, if you uh, if if you're like. Nate and I, and you've configured a new service, but for some reason, you know you've uh, you're, you're troubleshooting it, and you can't get it to work. So you're opening up a whole bunch of holes on the firewall, and then by luck, we then figure out that hey, it's actually SE Linux preventing the service from um, uh, taking uh, accepting connections. Uh, then you will have fixed that. We'll fast forward in time, and now we're like, okay, let's reset all the let's reset the firewall back to default, and just um, make sure those holes are all closed up. I've just done that, and there you go. Everything's been reset to uh, to the original state, and that's my demo. I like that it has that feature to return it to the original state. <coughs> Excuse me, just because um, it's really easy. To be, be pottering around like why doesn't this service work change this change that change that especially if you don't fully understand why it doesn't work right and we talked about this in our into the terminal troubleshooting episode a while back where if you don't have a plan when you go in well sometimes in the middle of an <coughs> or something you can't have a plan because you got someone breathing over your shoulder fix it right so the ability to just reset it and say oh i found what worked reset it apply that one change you end up with a much cleaner and more secure firewall at the end. So I like that that, that feature's added. Right, configuration and drift is, is a serious problem. And if it's not entirely um, obvious, by having all these firewall, like all these firewall system role playbooks lying around, if you're installing new services or you're experimenting with new applications that um, are standing up new services, you can always go around opening up all these holes and then realize, ah, yes, this is the one I need. And then I can go back and modify my original firewall system rule playbook and just have, reapply that again. So like, you can very easily modify your firewall configuration and reapply it. Not only that, but apply it to multiple hosts after you've figured out what you need open. Cool stuff. So before we move on to the next section, we did have a couple of questions here in chat that I, I wanted to surface. Um, let's see if I can find first one here. OK. Um, so the first one, and um, heads up, Nate, I might send this one your way, being our cloud expert. But uh, Shantanu asked, uh, how much does Red Hat expect companies to use RHEL on the cloud versus on-premises, where RHEL has always been the leader? So um, expect is a, is a tough word, right? So uh, we, we can't say that Red Hat expects you to do anything, right? We don't want to push you in any direction. And that's always been one of the core tenets of Red Hat in general, is that we don't want to have to make decisions for you. We want to give you options 
so that you can make the decision that is the best for your use case and your company, right? Whatever you're doing, we want to we want you to be able to do it with Red Hat software. Uh, that being said, um, the I'm, I'm gonna not necessarily refocus, but shift that concept to the whole point of Rail on the cloud <coughs> is that if you're moving, whether whether you're on prem or whether you're in a cloud provider, whatever cloud provider you're in, we want that platform to be uniform, right? So if you're on Rail on prem should feel just like RHEL on AWS, just like RHEL on Azure, just like RHEL on whatever uh, cloud provider you wanna be on, right? So the instead of what do we expect you to do, it's what do we enable you to do? And we enable you to have a constant platform, a portable platform, right? Across any cloud that you wanna run on. So I hope that that answers the question, right? It's not an, ex it's not an expectation, it's, a, it's an ability that we try to <laughs> empower you with. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've I've been in environments where we used Ubuntu for this thing in this data center, and then we had CentOS for this thing in this cloud provider, but then all the data center was Red Hat. Um, and that becomes very, very maddening when you're working on multiple things at once, because let's, let's be real, as sysadmins, we could never work on one project at a time. It was working on all the projects all at the same time. Thank you for thank you to the open source community for Tmux because you really saved my sanity. But being able to run the exact same commands, run follow the exact same procedures, whether it's data center, cloud, uh, public cloud, private cloud, doesn't matter. It's all the same, no matter where you go. And you get you get those you get that value of subscription as well. Things like Red Hat Insights, things like being able to open support cases for any of your workloads, no matter where they're running. Um, so, <coughs> like Nate, I wouldn't. Wouldn't so much say expect, uh, but enable would probably be a uh, a better uh, a better descriptor. Yeah, and the 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 portability really is is a an overlooked use case, right? So, mm -hmm. a decade ago, it was really popular. Shut down your data centers, move to the cloud, right? One hundred percent cloud. We're moving everything to the cloud. All the new startups should be on the cloud, right? Um, and now we're seeing a trend where some of those workloads that went to the cloud for lots of reasons. Was it too expensive to run it in the cloud? Did it not offer the features that they wanted? Whatever. Some of those are coming back to the data center, right? And if it was on rail in the data center, and if it's on rail in the cloud, that move becomes so much easier because the platforms are the same. The application should run, you know, you, you should be able to install it the same on the two different platforms. A backup that was made on one should be able to be restored to the other, for example, right? So those are important things to think about, right? When you're talking about RHEL on a cloud provider versus on-prem. Yeah. And so Shantanu also had a follow-up question. I think, uh, Matthew, we might come to you for this one. Um, does port level firewall seem so on-premise versus cloudy uh, with their own security groups and app level service mesh like console connects, which we do service level firewall. So I think the I think the the gist of this question and and Shantanu feel feel free to correct me if I'm wrong uh, is basically should we be using the operating system level firewall for cloud based workloads or should we rely more on um, should we re rely more on cloud uh, resources or even you could do this on prem uh, of relying on like the edge routers with uh, uh, with with firewalls and that kind of thing. I think it depends on what the business wants to do. If you don't have the resources to sit there configuring, well, let's 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 look at it this way. In a physical data center, it takes a lot of resources to go around sitting, auditing every single port, making sure it's all turned on properly, um, making sure all the VLANs are correctly configured, um, and then plugging your server in and just hoping everything works as it should. I think it's a relatively low effort and low cost to apply this system role, to apply these rules to your server to secure it. Um, I don't know. It, it, it totally, it depends on the customer or the user. I don't know what they would want to do. I know so I would I use this. It's just a lot easier, right? And and it was it was tricky. Uh, I, I worked in both environments 
where it's like we have uh, we have F fives or whatever that handle a lot of the port managing, load balancing, or firewall services. So we could just shut off all the firewalls inside the data center, um, and that's a very fortress, very castle like approach. But the problem is, what if someone's inside the network already? Like it's an inside job, or what if um, what if uh, someone manages to break in through an out of date web server? and they're in your network, now you've got nothing separating servers from servers. Um, so I've, I've been of the mindset that you should do security in, in, uh, in layers. And especially with, with these updated system roles, it's very easy to go in, wipe out the configuration, and only open up the specific ports. Like if, you're, if you've got a server that's running a, a database, you don't need the web ports open. So nuke that configuration, open only the ports needed for whether it's database uh, HA or maybe it's uh, <coughs> maybe there's a web UI for the database. You only need to open certain ports for certain services. And I think adding in automation and then things like insights to monitor drift um, really make it easier to have that defense in layers. Uh, and Mr. Iron says admin, do you have anything to, to add? I, I know security is kind of your, your your bread and butter, so I don't I don't want yeah. to move on past that question without asking you. The concept you're, you're describing is called defense in depth, right? So you've got that's what I was looking for. You've got an outer perimeter of defense, which would be like say your network firewall or maybe a firewall at the gateway, right, between you and the internet, and then you've got network isolation firewalls between different networks, right? Like the place I used to work, we had a crazy set of isolation right, where each network, like there was a network just for databases and that the network firewall would only allow the ports for databases from any other network into there because why else would you need to get in, right? And then we'd have host level firewalls that would say only these hosts can get to this host, right? So, you know, defense in depth, right? And that's exactly what you were describing. If one of those databases got compromised, you couldn't get to the other ones. If the web server got compromised it can only get to the database that it's allowed to get to right those are the, those are that that's the concept right um i saw a talk once of this guy he decided he used puppet to do this but they had no network firewall it was all done with ip tables all managed with puppet and they basically had all this automation in place that um the only traffic that could ever get to any machine was traffic they had dictated was allowed to get there right so there's management traffic of course but anything else which is blocked outright, except for specifically, this service needs to talk to that one, so that's allowed, right? That's a little bit further to the other direction, but you could imagine doing something similar with that that network or with the, the firewall uh, system role. Right? <coughs> sure you, you could get that crazy with it if you needed to. I, I wanna clarify what I was trying to get at with my original answer to this question, uh, as in making this the choice of the customer, but, mm -hmm. Suppose you had the ability to buy all this really fancy, expensive equipment like an F5, whatever, or um, and um, have everything, have all of your connections scrutinized at the lowest level, all the way up to the top level of the OSI stack. Well, what if one of these devices, like, first of all, they cost a lot of money. Second of all, what happens when they go down? And do you, like, who is maintaining these things? So, I mean, that's why they're all good. I'm not saying it's not a good solution. I think it's a great solution, but how much money have you got? How many people do you have? And that's why I say it's a business decision. So I, I think Matthew must have been a sysadmin in previous life because what I'm hearing is do, do all of your own security at your own level because you can never trust whether or not that other thing still works. <laughs> that's not Which what is, I'm saying at all. Yeah, no. <laughs> No, no, but it's it's a it's a choice based on budget and expertise, really, right? And, and yeah, what, yeah, yeah. So the the high end security appliances are great because they're high end security appliances, but they expensive, <laughs> right? Like, and they require an admin on staff that'll that'll run the thing, right? Whereas, like, do you, do you guys know anybody that run any people that run OpenStack? Do you I know do, do you know what an OpenStack course. admin makes? Oh yeah, OpenStack is crazy complicated, and because of yeah. it, there I mean, are very like, specialized. OpenStack's also free, but like, well, no, right? Yeah, you pay for it in admins. Yeah, right. 
Yep. So speaking of security, Mr. Iron Sysadmin, uh, I believe you had a couple of things in uh, in nine one and eight seven that you were really excited to to talk about. Yep, yep. So this is actually a new feature in nine one. I looked at the release notes. I do not think it came to eight seven, but uh, Eric, if you know differently, please feel free to correct me. No, but I think you're right. there's there's a new feature. Uh, the upstream project is called Keylime, um, but it's also referred to as Measured Secure Boot, right? And the idea is familiar with secure boot, right? Where kernel modules are signed and the the trusted platform module has to have code that says, yes, that module is okay to run. Otherwise the system won't boot, right? Uh, uh, this takes that a step further where, uh, of course, if it's all local and it's a machine that is in a hostile environment, for example, like it's in a warehouse somewhere or it's in the back of a retail place, right? Where Maybe you can't necessarily guarantee that uh, Joe Public can't get there or that your average employee isn't going to go in there and walk around with your server, right? Um, so imagine this is more like the edge use case, right? Uh, what Measured Secure Boot does is there's a third-party server. I shouldn't say a third-party. There's a managed server by your organization somewhere in a secured location where when your machine in your insecure location boots up, it checks in with. Right. And it'll say, you know, like, look, these are the modules that are running. Right. And it can it can I don't think it'll it'll prevent boot at the moment, but it, it can alert administration that says this machine came on. It's got unsigned code running. That's not a good thing. Maybe you want to go check it out. Right. So that's that's a cool brandy new feature. Um, I, I, I should have grabbed a slide to show the the overall uh, architecture of how that thing works out because describing it in words may it may not have come through all that clearly <laughs> right. but uh, it's it's neat technology especially if you if you manage machines that are in a, a location like I described where it's not a data center right it's like the back room at a warehouse or you know like behind the kitchen at your your uh, your restaurant or whatever right where you can't guarantee that it's in a secure environment. So I think that I thought it was pretty cool, and I thought it was worth mentioning today because it is a brand new feature. Uh, maybe we can put a link to maybe the release notes or some docs. I didn't include them in your notes, but I'll try to get them to you when we're done here. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Keyline and, is, is definitely something that we're we're looking into as an organization. It's 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 part of that defense in depth and kind of ties into uh, some of the initiatives around software bill of materials, that kind of thing. Things that mm -hmm. basically state that. I'm running this piece of code, whether it doesn't matter if it's a kernel or an application or a library inside my, my MPM, uh, doesn't matter what, what or where at what level. Uh, basically, how do I know that what I'm getting and what I'm actually putting into memory to run is what I'm actually running? And, right. and so Keylime is, is a big piece of that, you know, preventing anyone from modifying the boot image uh, and, and I, I get our, our Keylime implementation and the upstream mixed up, but I, I believe coming soon, it will actually prevent boot. I think right now, like, like Nate said, it just uh, yeah. sends up a warning, but uh, that's the way I understand it as well. That currently it doesn't prevent boot. Awesome. It'll just warn, but yeah, that'll be that that's, that could be game changing <laughs> for folks that have to manage remote systems that are in uh, unsecured environments. Right. Because from a security perspective, right? Once you've got hands on keyboard, all bets are off. Well, this is starting to change that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. So we we mentioned that Nate, one of your one of your uh, areas of expertise is sort of the cloud technologies and and how to uh, how to deploy RHEL in the cloud uh, as so many of us are used to deploying in uh, data centers, and and one of one of my babies is uh, is Image Builder. And you came across something that you that you brought up actually in our team chat the other day uh, that we wanted to uh, we wanted to highlight on the show. Uh, so why don't you tell us about uh, what you discovered inside uh, Image Builder? Yeah. So um, I'm gonna and I may not be the only person that has that ha had a this revelation, right? <laughs> when I heard about Image Builder, I thought, oh, neat! It's just another way to package up and deploy Rail. I've already got Pixie Boot and Kickstart. Why do I need Image Builder, right? And as with many admins, right, it's because I wasn't thinking outside of my own box, right? The box I was in 
Kickstart worked perfectly fine for what I was doing. There was really no reason to look at something else. So I never really <laughs> gave Image Builder a second look. I knew that it existed. I knew what it did roughly, um, but I never really poked at it. Well, I've been poking at it lately. And I have to say that, especially from a cloud perspective, uh, this is a tool that folks might want to look at. If you do custom image deployments on the cloud, um, Image Builder can make your life so much easier, right? And it's 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 worth it's worth looking at. And if you're not using custom images on the cloud, um, you may be having some issues figuring out how to get your cloud images or your cloud deployments compliant from a security perspective, right? So there, there's certain requirements that some people have, like, for example, um, partition layouts, right? Partition layouts are hard to change after deployment, where uh, with a cloud deployment, that if you just pick in RHEL or whatever from your cloud provider, it's deployed with, a, with whatever partition table was baked into that image. Well, Image Builder makes that an option now, right? So you can take Image Builder and you can, you can design your own deployment and then you can actually publish it directly to your cloud provider. And you can use that to, to do further builds, right? So you can then build and come back in with automation to finish up your, your build process. And uh, I do have a quick demo here, but uh, I kind of want to lead it up with that. And Eric, I know you're probably deeper into Image Builder than, than I am. So if you had any more commentary to add there, feel free about Image Builder in general. I think the, about the only thing I'd add is that uh, Image Builder has been progressing very, very rapidly in the number of features that are available. Um, yep. it, it is kind of our one of our first attempts, kind of alongside Insights, of having a service uh, that you can use to, to talk about things or, or to, to fix problems that we've dealt with for years. Things like Kickstart, things like um, custom images, templates, uh, but if you if you haven't checked out Image Builder in the past uh, three months um, or six months or longer, uh, the product changes very very rapidly, and we're we're only taking like snapshots when we do uh, one of these what's new episodes uh, because the the service and the uh, and the on prem version uh, move at different paces. So definitely keep an eye out on console.redhat.com as, as well as the beta offering. Uh, so the beta version of the service is, is available there as well. Um, so definitely a lot of cool things going on in that space. Yeah, so it's worth mentioning that this is not, this is, this is not a new feature of 9.1 or 8.7, but it is moving quickly, right? And you know because of that, it's definitely worth mentioning on this episode because there's probably been changes to the hosted version uh, since 9.0 was released. So is it new for 9.1? I suppose. <laughs> All right, so we, we touched on local versus hosted. Uh, there is a hosted version of this. It's on the hybrid cloud console. That's what I'm sharing at the moment. If you, for some reason, do not want to use our hosted version, or if you have requirements to you know do this sort of stuff on-prem, there is a, a locally hosted version of Image Builder. You can just run it on top of any RHEL 8 or 9 box. Uh, it's got a similar UI based in the web console. Right, so if you use uh, the, the the cockpit web web console, uh, but I'm going to be showing you the one that's hosted on the hybrid cloud console. So uh, first of all, uh, let's see. I'll, I'll give Eric a chance here to get everything search situated here. Is this large enough? Should I make it bigger? A little bigger if you can. And yes, I've I've been playing around with our with our streaming platform a bit today. <laughs> all right, is that large enough? <laughs> Excuse yeah, me. That's, that's all right. Work. So this is just like the page you get to when you log in. And of course, this is talking about Rosa, but that's not what we're interested in at the moment. I'm going to go to the menu on the side here. We're going to go to RHEL and we're going to go to Red Hat Insights. So Image Builder is like a sub feature of the Insights uh, portal here, right? So we're in Insights. If you're not familiar with Insights, we could probably do an episode on Insights at some point. Maybe there already has been one I don't know about, but uh, Lots, lots and lots of stuff in here that you can you can learn about insights. But we're going to go to Image Builder, which is toward the bottom of this menu on the side here. Now, Image Builder is not all that complicated when you get to it from here, which which might surprise you. Right. Uh, obviously, there's a bunch of images already in here because this is my employee account. Anyone who's ever tested Image Builder uh, on a Red Hat account, I've got access to their image here for you know, for the, your average use case, you're going to have just the images that you built in here, right? So don't be don't be surprised by the number of images I've got here. You'll have an empty page if you've never been here before. 
Uh, so if you want to, you basically you hit the this little create image button, and this is part of the coolness, right? Um, first of all, we can pick what version of RHEL we want to base this on, and what's going to come out the other end is the latest and greatest on that version. So I can pick RHEL nine, RHEL eight, and you can even there's even some options for development like CentOS Stream and whatnot. But we're going to talk about just RHEL nine today because why not use the latest and greatest, right? So once this thing is deployed, it's going to be RHEL 9.1 with the latest updates, right? It's not going to be just like 9.0 as it released and then you have to patch it. It's going to be the latest and greatest. So when it's time to redeploy or, you know, if you're quarterly releasing a new golden image or maybe even you're one of these, these shops that has everything in line and you can, you can deploy a new version of RHEL and put your application on it via some CI CD pipeline, uh, you could build this into that pipeline and end up with a brandy new fresh rail install at the beginning of that process, right? So keep that in mind. That's that's part of the power here, right? And you don't even have to host this. This is hosted on our side, on our cloud. So you can basically use an API. Uh, I was poking around at the API earlier today. It's actually kind of neat. Uh, but you can pass a JSON request into the API. It'll spit out an image at the other end. You don't even have to use this UI. But I'm going to take you through the UI because... Uh, APIs don't make good demos, if you ask me. <laughs> All right. So one of the cool things here is you can pick a cloud provider. Now, it's only got the big three at the moment. Um, but yeah, you can pick more than one even, right? So, and what it'll do is in the next step, uh, after I've picked one of these, is it'll ask me for an account ID that it can then share the image with, right? And if, if I put in a valid account ID, which I'm not going to... I'm not going to for this demo because that's not the point of the demo. Uh, it'll actually share it for, in this example, it would share it with my AWS account. And then when it's done building, there's literally a button I click and it would take me to AWS and I can deploy a new uh, cloud VM in EC2 based on the image that I just defined, right? And there's also options for VMware, of course, because why wouldn't there be? Or usual virtualization guests, like a more generic format, use it with like Libbird or KVM. Uh, you can even have it spit out an ISO that you could then build a machine from, right? So that's kind of cool too. Uh, so we're going to pick AWS and virtualization guest image. We're going to hit next. Like I said, it's going to ask me for an account ID. And I'm just going to put in, I forget how long this has to be, like 15 characters or something. We'll just kind of go until the next button lights up. That's not on an actual account ID, so don't try to copy it down. Um, but if you if you do put a valid one in there, that's how that's how this automation works at the end. Uh, oh, it looks like you can pick a region now. That wasn't here last time I did this. Like Eric was saying, this is changing quickly, right? So, all right. And then we're going to hit. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. I, I didn't even realize that that was a thing. And Image Builder is one of uh, part of my patch. <laughs> yeah, right. So apparently that's that's a recent change, right? Images are built in the default region, copied to other regions later. Okay. So anyway, oh, okay, maybe no, that's, just, that's just telling me which one it is. I don't think it'll let me change it. No, it's just telling me it's going to build. It's going to be built on US East one. Okay, and then we hit next. About that, it goes to the default region, and then you can copy it. That's that's yeah. more of a you are here than a. Than yeah, a it sounds like although it's, I think the selector piece is on the roadmap. Cool, cool. Well, that's good. All right, and then of course it's a rail box. Um, you can have it register out of the box, or you can do that manually later, or I guess through automation later. Um, you can have it register with us and with insights, you can have it register just for content or you can have it not register at all, right? And if you tell it to register either, whether you want them registered or registered with insights, you have to pick an activation key in here. Now these are activation keys you would have defined in the customer portal, right? So uh, you have to have that set up before you come into the image builder window, image builder wizard here, or you can just do register later and then do it yourself at the end. So uh, we're just gonna leave it and we're gonna pick just any old activation key that's in the list here and we're going to hit next now we can pick partitioning um this is kind of the thing i was i was mentioning before right a lot of security standards say things like temp has to be its own partition or you know home or var or whatever have to be separate partitions or maybe your own standardization says that var has to be its own partition so that logging can't fill up the root drive that kind of thing with a normal cloud instance, that's hard to define. Some of them have that kind of stuff out of the box, but it's really nice to be able to configure it yourself, right? So I'm going to tell it manually. It's 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 already given me a root partition of 10 gig. Let's just add, I don't know, temp or something in here. 
just to show you how this works. And then we can tell it how big it should be. I don't know. What do you think? Five gig for temp. And of course, you can go crazy here. You can add as many partitions as you want. And then uh, hit next. Now it'll let me tell, it'll let me add packages in as well, right? So my usual demo here is good old HTTPD. And what this will do is as it builds the image, it'll automatically install HTTPD as it's going, right? You could also add in like, I don't know, your favorite text editor or, you know, other agents and whatnot, as long as they're included with the rel uh, base image or the, the rel uh, base OS repository, right? You can install them right from here. Okay. And we got to give it a name. I don't know. We'll call it rel presents. What's the episode? 49. And then it gives us a summary, right? It's, it's telling us that we're going to share this with Amazon. There's the account ID we picked. How is it going to be registered? The system configuration, like um, how big the partition table we designed and things like that. Additional packages. It just tells me what's chosen. Not, it doesn't show me a list of them. And then we just hit create. And what this will do is it'll take us back to that list. And you'll see at the top of the queue, there'll be a new image that's being built. In fact, there's two of them, because remember, we selected both AWS and uh, a local uh, uh, QCAL file. And we're not going to wait for those to finish just because they'll take a few minutes. And, you know, we're live streaming and standing here waiting for things to finish on a live stream is boring. But I do want to call out this. See, these are these are ones I built earlier today. This test image here. And these three dots over here on the side, there's an option here that says download compose request. And what that does is it'll give you a JSON dump of what I defined here. And then you can take that JSON dump and you can pass it back into the image builder API to repeat this build later if you need to. Because remember, like I said, if you wait three months and issue the exact same build again, what you're going to get is the latest and greatest software that comes from RHEL three months from now, right? So that's that's great for for repeatability. Nate, yes, is that compose file usable with local image builder? So the the JSON file you get out. So the local image builder uses a thing called a Toml file, which is not JSON. It's more like uh, YAML, if I remember correctly. Maybe Toml is its own format. I'm not really sure, but uh, you can take what's in this JSON file and translate it to the Toml file. Uh, but I don't think you can just grab this and throw it into your local image builder unless, and this is what I was trying to figure out when I was poking at the API earlier. I think the local version of image builder has the same API, but I think it has to be enabled. And I wasn't able to figure out how to turn it on. Uh, but I think that you can take this JSON, pass it into the API on local image builder, uh, and then you could throw out the same image on a, on a local hosted uh, image builder. That'd be really cool. So I've been looking into try to, trying to do that because I'm curious about it. So don't take my word for that. Uh, if I can figure it out, then maybe I'll share it on a future show or whatever. But uh, but yeah, I think I think it works that way. So yeah, in, in Q1, I'm hoping to uh, to start putting together a a blog series that walks through how do we start to automate the process of doing. Um, uh, infrastructure as code, uh, right. kicks, uh, not kickstarting, but bootstrapping new systems. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with some of the content that you and I've worked together on, Nate, on Into the Terminal with Image Builder, with Kickstart, um, and some of the things that, uh, uh, that Matthew and Brian have been working on with system roles. How do I go about you know, building a sane golden image and then layering on top what I need um, using all of uh using as many um red hat products as i can things like uh image builder and, and system roles <coughs> so uh i definitely hope to be able to answer those questions uh yeah. as, as we move forward um, yeah yeah and i i would be surprised to find out if they did not have a similar api that you could pass the same json into your local image builder but since I haven't been able to test it and I haven't found documentation about it, I can't verify that that is in fact true, but I think it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't provide much more of an answer than that. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's it for the demo. Um, actually, one of them finished. Uh, if you can see in the little tiny one there, you can see there's a link there to download that file now. 
Um, the, the cloud version is not done yet, but see, there it is. So yeah, that's image builder. And it's, you know, I, I gotta say, I didn't give it enough credit and I wish I had because this, I can, I'm already using it for my own local deployments now for like lab VMs and stuff. Um, I'm using the locally hosted image builder to churn out a new rail box when I need to. And then I have an image to base them off of. And it's, it's actually really convenient. I want to put in a plug here. If you sure. want to manage your host like a like a <laughs> like a cell phone, go ahead and use the uh, edge management system and use Image Builder mm. to build yourself an image with RPM OS tree. There you go. The uh, um, I guess another have to bring Matthew back on to talk about that. That sounds like yeah. a great way to to use Edge Manager to uh, to manage systems. Forgive the uh, the poor English choices there. <laughs> another thing, and uh, I forget if I mentioned this about the local image builder, you can manage it with Web Console as well, right? So there's it's not identical mm -hmm. to what you just saw in the hybrid cloud console, uh, but it's similar. The same basic concept where you have a wizard where you walk through and give it the answers, and then it'll it'll spit out a, an image at the other end. And so on, on the image builder front, I uh, actually had a couple of questions regarding uh, uh, security preset profiles, things like CIS. Uh, and I'm really excited to say that um, that in the command line version, so uh, I believe it's uh, believe it's Compose, uh, we have support now on the command line side for pre-selecting uh, security profile. So whether that's CIS or HIPAA or one of those. Um, so from the command line version, that, that TOML file that Nate was talking about, you can actually specify that. So your system, your golden image that comes out on the other side will have all of those configurations, uh, configure, configuration options already set. I speak for a living, if you can tell. Um, <coughs> I don't have an idea of when that's coming to the UI, but I know it's coming. But uh, so if, if you are in an environment where you need to have security profiles, look into the into the compose, uh, which is basically the command line version of the self hosted uh, image builder. So really excited that that was one of the things that came out in um, that came out as part of nine one and eight seven. Um, so hopefully that lands in the UI here pretty soon. Now you, you also may have noticed that that wizard that I just walked you through seemed simplistic, right? There were maybe some things that you might have expected to see there that you know Image Builder can do. The API will still let you do things like add users, probably set that OpenSCAP profile, though again, I haven't tried it. That was one of the things I wanted to poke at. Uh, but you can do more with the API than you can with the wizard, as with many things, right? So uh, just keep that in mind, that if you wanted to do things like, say, add a default user, you could pass that through that JSON uh, payload if you're using the API. All right. Uh, so I'm kind of winding down the episode here. Uh, something on the image builder and migrations front is that uh, all our tools are now EUS aware. So if you want to just update uh, to specific minor versions, typically even numbered versions, uh, you can now do that with tools like the in-place upgrade, uh, leap tool, convert to rel, as well as the, I believe, the self-hosted image builder. Um, so if you if you don't want to go to the latest and greatest, but want to land on the EUS release, a lot of our tools are now uh, EUS aware. So we we only got through, <laughs> we didn't get through all of our list, but uh, <coughs> but I feel like the Q and A uh, and the conversation was well well worth it. Uh, sometimes it most feels, of it. Yeah, sometimes an hour feels like a long time. Other times it's it's not nearly enough, but uh, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, really appreciate folks like 8th Doctor and Shantanu uh, and, and Rick and, and a few others that join us on a regular basis. Uh, Queen Anne's Revenge. Thank you all really, truly for joining us. Um, this is the last Rail Presents for the year, and we've got one more episode of Into the Terminal on Friday. Scott and I uh, have a what we're, we're hoping will be a fun episode planned of here's some weird things that sysadmins have done to themselves or user Linux users have done to themselves uh, that have broken things and how to go about fixing them. Um, I, I looked at our episode guide today and currently that list is at zero. So uh, we need to sit down tomorrow and come up with some, some interesting things that we've broken. But uh, 
the end of the, end of the terminal troubleshooting uh, series has been our episode arc has been going on, and uh, and it's it's been a lot of fun. Nate, you've been on one. <coughs> <coughs> you were on one of those episodes, and they've been they've been a big hit. So, um, so from all of us here at, uh, at Red Hat Enterprise Linux, part of Red Hat, uh, thank you all for being a part of what we're doing. Uh, we'll we'll be back here in gosh, I guess a month with uh, Rel Presents. I think we're going to have OpenShift, uh, some of the OpenShift folks on. So you might, if you've watched the OpenShift channel, we'll have a couple of their hosts on to talk about uh, OpenShift virtualization. So how do you run RHEL on top of OpenShift? Uh, so in the meantime, make sure to take some time off work, uh, free public service announcements. Uh, enjoy the holidays, enjoy some time off, or as many of us do, go play in your home lab. Uh, but in the meantime, on behalf of Matthew Yee, Nate, and the entire Red Hat Enterprise Linux team, thank you all for joining us, and we will see you in 2023. Have a safe holiday, everybody.